I guess I should probably cut back on the drinking, but uh, it makes me feel good. This is the YouTuber ContraPoints. I mean, I can't sleep for more than two hours at a time, and I do not get erections anymore. But apart from that, it's fine. ContraPoints runs a YouTube channel in which he discusses political and cultural issues from a feminist and progressive perspective. In addition to his leftist political views, ContraPoints also incorporates a little bit of a drag routine and mixes in some spicy self-deprecating comedy, a little bit akin to Red Letter Media or some other review site like the Nostalgia Critic. I always like listening to people who have different views than me, and the addition of the production value and the humor really made an impact. Though I'm thoroughly unimpressed by camp, I would be remiss if I didn't say that ContraPoints did get a joke on the point every now and again, and it is a quality channel. Of course, there is the very standard problem with sincerity in all of these things. For some reason, progressives in the modern world always mix their political commentary with humor and entertainment, so it's impossible to know whether any one point is being made sincerely or not. This is only compounded by camp, but nonetheless I continue to watch. This might be the beginning of an interesting conversation. I always thought that feminists and traditionalists would have more in common if but they only talked to each other. And so when ContraPoints finally did do a episode on denouncing the very scummy pickup artist community, I was interested. I was even more interested when I saw that ContraPoints chose to use Don Giovanni, Mozart's famous opera, as the template for that criticism. But at the end of watching that video, I was left with some very strange conclusions. There seemed to be a giant contradiction, and I know feminism and progressivism generally has consistency problems. And it wasn't just the camp, and it wasn't just the lack of some sincerity, and it wasn't just the sort of nascent hypocrisy that seems to occupy a lot of these arguments. It's that I realized that at the core, the ideology that ContraPoints, that Lacey Green, that Dan Savage, that any of these proponents of the sexual revolution and the new sexual order propound is intellectually incoherent and manifestly a lie. Perhaps some background is required. Pickup artists, the ostensible subject of ContraPoints' video, are a community of men who brag about their sexual exploits and provide mechanisms for essentially sleeping with women with little or no emotional commitment. Obviously, this is a very, very old fascination for men, dating back probably to the beginning of time, but during the mid to late 2000s, this really became a prominent community online, in the wake of a lot of men feeling like they were missing out on the sexual liberation that was available to them. Harboring some genuine grade-A douchebags like Rouge V and Mystery Method and supporting a fair amount of anti-feminism, the movement quickly gained a fair number of enemies, not just among traditionalist Christians, but also among feminist progressives. But the latter's opposition to the pickup artist movement was always a little bit mystifying. Whereas Christianity has a long history of really opposing free sexuality, in many ways feminism, or at least third wave feminism, was the product of the sexual revolution. The opposition seems to have very little substance to it. And so it's interesting to see ContraPoints, a uh, dyed in the wool feminist, Fasten upon the story of Don Juan, or Don Giovanni as he's also called, a classic testament of the Christian critique of the lascivious male. For those not familiar with the story, Don Giovanni follows the exploits of what in the 18th century would have been a pickup artist, a levacious young nobleman who seduces women and abandons them. After killing one of his conquest's father, he's lured by the man's ghost into a dinner where he's dragged to hell by Satan and his demons. The story is very old and predates Mozart's opera by a hundred years. It's usually used as a template to demonstrate how small sins of the flesh can lead to the corruption of character and total damnation. But of course, the feminist critique of Don Giovanni has the same problem of all feminist critiques of pickup artists. 
once you acknowledge that consent is the only necessary requirement for it to be good, how do you criticize a person who pursues it more earnestly? He seems like a less hypocritical version of your everyday person. And you hear feminists asking themselves crazy questions like this. Why do some men become obsessed with sleeping with a lot of women in the first place? Of course feminists couldn't condemn people for having too much sex. That would be hypocritical. And so we have to ask ourselves ridiculous questions in order to still be able to condemn Lotharios who have sex with hundreds and thousands of women with no emotional commitment. But ContraPoints thinks he's found the answer in Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni is not just a predator, but that he's actually fucking insane. He doesn't care whether the women are young or old, beautiful or ugly, rich or poor. He seduces them all the same, just to satisfy his manic urge to add them to the list. In the 21st century, there are men who are really like this. They're called pickup artists, and they want you to buy their erotic memoirs. Contrapoints goes on to make the additional comparison to modern pickup artists, saying that sure enough, his opposition to them is not sexual, not that they have too much sex, and not even that the sex is unemotional and detached, but rather that the sex is being done for the purposes of bragging rights and of braggadocio and pride. Now on the surface, this argument seems sublime, since it allows us to condemn the Lothario and the pickup artist for their manipulation without getting complicated by the fact that we are basically condemning a free sexual choice. This even has a consilience with the Christian idea, since sure enough, Mozart and the Christian story's illustration was how a lesser sin of lust could lead to the greater sin of pride where Don Giovanni sees his sexual exploits not just as hedonistic, but as a point of pride, something that he would refuse to confess. And this makes perfect sense, because of course feminist sexuality is fine with hedonism, as long as people don't feel pride and excess braggadocio about all the people they slept with, as long as they don't parade it around, and of course they wouldn't do anything like that. So like all things, this makes sense until you think about it for five minutes. Why should pride be wrong in the feminist lens? I used to know a person who collected matchbooks, of all things. Is it any wonder that men will start trying to collect notches on their bedposts? And if other men find that something that they want to, how can you expect them not to actually want to achieve that through any consensual means possible? And it's made additionally ridiculous by ContraPoint's continued insistence throughout the entire video that feminism is not anti-sex and that the only criterion for a good sexual relationship is consent, something that the seducer and the pickup artist both have. Once left doubting the sincerity of the entire project, even ContraPoint's continued insistence that he's some kind of decadent hedonist, as he illustrates again and again with his cutaways, falls short when you hear his story earlier in his videos about how he became a feminist when one feminist corrected him for looking at her legs on a subway car. I don't know what great hedonists and debauchers do or have done in times past since I'm not one of them. But I'm pretty fucking sure they don't go red and blush the second they get corrected for looking at a woman's legs in a subway car. Nothing about this makes any fucking sense, and so we're left looking at ContraPoint's arguments, and in fact all of ContraPoint's arguments, a lot like any person as part of the sexual revolution, looks at something like Don Giovanni. It's an artifact that makes no sense because we've already conceded the actions it describes are no longer prescribed and condemned by society. In the story, Don Giovanni is brought to heel and literally brought to hell by the physical manifestation of patriarchy, the ghost of the father of one of the women he seduced. But we now live in a world where that patriarchal ghost of sexual norms and restraint is totally absent. Don Giovanni, Don Juan, stands triumphant, but what does it all mean? Do we no longer want to condemn him? Is he a hero? Is he anything? What does debauchery even mean in an age where everything sexual is meaningless and consumeristic? Even the lifestyle that these queer hedonists try to affect draws reference back to the 17th century and 18th century, where ostentatious consumption was done in opposition to puritanical norms that existed in the century before. But modern hedonism resists nothing. It's not heroic, and therefore all the ostentatiousness and glory that surrounded it in the 18th century is utterly meaningless and facile. 
There might be some kind of romantic heroism in stealing off from town in Paris when the vicar and bishop were breathing down your neck. But we're talking now about a hedonism where men claim to be man whores and sleep with all sorts of people, and then shrink away in terror the second someone thinks that their eyeballs are pointing in the wrong direction. This isn't heroism, it's pathetic. Even the Puritans who guarded their heart from lust had the dignity being true to their convictions. And so we're left in a sexual culture that seems like it has almost nothing. ContraPoint's drag affectation is the perfect example of this. I don't believe for a second he feels more comfortable dressed as a woman, but I think being dressed as a fake woman makes it less obvious how fake he would seem as a man. A Don Giovanni who was the scourge of patriarchs and who danced before the fires of hell was at least interesting, but one that stands with no opposition to himself whatsoever is pathetic. And so the whole story of the sexual revolution, at least in its romantic dimension, comes unraveled before us, and we have to ask where that leaves us. I can already anticipate an objection coming from the previous portion where I examined hedonism and how hollow it seems in the modern age post-sexual revolution. But I think probably a more pertinent topic for most people is how we form relationships. And this really gets to the heart of the sexual revolution. So where do we really begin with something like the sexual revolution? Strangely enough, I think we begin with my own generation's experience with the sexual revolution. I'm an older millennial, and in many ways, millennials are the first generation to truly understand what the sexual revolution meant. Because they were the first generation to be born into the sexual revolution, to be born of parents who were themselves part of the sexual revolution. They never had to contend with any kind of ideology other than that. And I can't say the experience has been altogether positive for almost anyone I've known. But I'll start with my own reservations. That is, as a young man in the early 21st century, and how I thought I could resolve the contradictions implicit in the sexual culture of modernity. There's a certain fact of life that almost every young man of a reserved character learns between the ages of 17 and 25. And that is that the sexual culture that people constantly propound, that's constantly given to you by feminists and by other people in the mainstream media, has really very little to do with the reality of dating and searching for partners in the real world. A lot of the behaviors people, and in particular boys, are taught at an early stage of life are ultimately counterproductive when it comes to attracting the opposite sex, and there's a great deal of anger on that front. I think the blogger Blonde in the Belly of the Beast puts it the best. Millennia beta males, which is a huge demographic, are very, very angry, and rightfully so. They are doing what their feminist mothers taught them, which is appeal to women's emotions and listen to them and comfort them, support them. Um, but they're being rebuffed because although women will say that this is what they want, they don't. <laughs> they simply don't. And worse, behaving in the way that modern women say they want you to, emotionally discussing feelings ad nauseum, will be the very behavior that turns women off to you. And I can remember feeling this way at a certain point in my life, too. And I would like to think that I eventually got over it by finding out how ridiculous the entire endeavor of meaningless sex was, but instead I found a more common explanation, a way of putting it all together, and this came in the form of one man called Dan Savage. Define GGG. What does sex positive mean? GGG, good, giving, and game. What we should all be for our partners and what we have a right to expect from our partners. Good, in bed. Um, giving means sometimes you give pleasure without an expectation of an immediate return on that. Uh, and game means up for anything within reason. People do and will, and, I, and you say this and people kind of get upset. Sex is trivial. Sex doesn't matter. How could you sacrifice a beautiful, loving relationship for something as meaningless or trivial as sex. People do it all the time. People sabotage relationships all the time. Sexual fulfillment is important. Dan Savage is a popular sex advice columnist who works in the Seattle area, and he also has a popular podcast. But most recently, and by recently I mean five or six years ago at this point, he became famous as a gay rights advocate, in particular starting the campaign It Gets Better. 
But I think more importantly, Dan Savage is really known as a person who laid out in full the full consequences of the new sexual order that's come to pass. Sure enough, the feminist utopia, where emotionally supplicating males are desired by females, is a manifest lie. Sure enough, the idea of the free love 60s is never going to come to pass, but Dan Savage painted a real enough picture with only a few elements in it. The sexual culture that was only decided by consent, quality, and contract. Sure enough, no sexual relationship, marital relationship, or even family relationship was guaranteed under this plan, but it still created the boundaries for understanding how sex worked and how it would be procured in a realistic sense. If you couldn't get a date, you weren't demonstrating sufficient value for your partners. All sexual acts were up to the standard of consent, and moreover, any relationship was just what two people contracted for themselves. There is no necessary reason to talk about what society did or what society said, because every single norm was renegotiated every single time two people came together, or in Dan Savage's case, more than two people. Norms were altogether immaterial and not worth talking about. In many ways, this solves the entire question of fairness and sexual culture, because it places the emphasis completely on the individual, and for a long time, this idea of sexuality made a lot of sense to me. It really allowed me to integrate the realities of 21st century sexual culture with my notions of what was right and wrong. But there is so much missing from it, and there is so much that's unstated about it. I'm not the first person to point out that the rules that Dan Savage brings to sexuality are very common, because they're the rules of corporate America. Dan Savage hasn't really liberated sex as much as he's incorporated it and turned it into a consumer product. Nothing is really lasting beyond the contract in Dan Savage's world. This isn't a place where marriages mean more than an agreement that's to be dissolved as soon as the relationship is no longer satisfying for both parties. It's even really hard to imagine how children could work into this world. I mean, I know Dan Savage and his partner have children, and apparently they're very happily partnered, but the reality of the sexual ethic that Dan Savage is promoting would result in many, many fractious relationships would, would end to the detriment of most children. Moreover, anyone who's listened to Dan Savage, either now or in the past, will realize that despite being a very outspoken feminist himself, the world he describes really exists in a place where a lot of the modern developments of feminism don't seem to have happened. There never is really a reference to affirmative consent laws, and it seems to a large degree like Dan Savage ignores or explains away a lot of feminist objections to things like objectification. Moreover, I never really hear him talk about the reality of the legal ramifications of getting divorced, which can be quite stringent for a lot of people. If we take these exceptions aside and put them in a box, in many ways Dan Savage's vision of a purely consent-driven, a purely quality-driven sexual culture is quite compelling. It even dovetails nicely with the sort of anarcho-capitalist and, dare I say, highly autistic version of the universe, where all ethics come down to free choice and any deviation from liberty is wrong. Therefore, to a person who likes a certain amount of symmetry and is willing to ignore a certain amount of the details, this perspective can seem quite compelling. And it also sells well, because this corporate version of sexuality is also a bonanza for people who are trying to sell sex. So we're left asking ourselves, is this it? Have we solved the problem of the sexual rev revolution? Is there a golden age of coherency once we've accomplished destigmatizing the last few barriers to free consent? Legalized prostitution, legalized polygamy, legalized pretty much anything. Would that this were so. I admit that unlike a lot of elements of feminism, there is a hint of truth to this. In fact, the free market is a real thing, and it applies to value exchanges, and sex is a value exchange. But that's not really the whole statement of it. The free market is a massively simplistic model, and even in financial markets, we see that there are a lot of externalities, a lot of inequalities that develop. The sort of Adam Smith perspective where everyone freely consents to everything and that makes it fine works all right, but it has this assumption that everybody comes to the table being a more or less equal individual with no prior wealth or capital accumulated. Moreover, it presupposes the existence of a society, a society that's built collectively and which not all members share in equally. 
This creates a funny situation where people who work towards the betterment of society can actually be disadvantaged in the long term by a free market exchange that's entirely selfish. This is why even in completely free market societies, the government will take some aspects of the community and place it outside of the market for the good of the market itself. A key example of this is law enforcement. So where am I going with this and what does it have to do with sex? Well, to be perfectly blunt about it, in a free market, regardless of how good it is on average, people get fucked. I only tell you one time. Don't fuck me, Tony. Don't you ever try to fuck me. And while getting fucked and taken advantage of is painful enough in an economic sense, it's even worse in a personal, sexual, and relationship sense. People don't all come to the table, especially in the sexual matter, as equal individuals all looking for more or less the same thing and willing to pay more or less the same thing. It's a competition where people are massively unequal, have massively different amounts of resources, and subsequently things are unfair. People lose the ability that they would have had otherwise to negotiate for themselves. And things that would have seemed like fair exchanges up front turn out to have major consequences down the road that no party are really willing to stand behind. This is the reason why most modern societies, and indeed most traditional societies that had advanced agriculture, really did not have sex as a marketplace value. This is also the reason why prostitution, or legalized prostitution, as good as it looks on paper, and as good as it looks in the libertarian anarchist's mind, never seems to have good consequences when legalized in actual societies. Men and women have different market values which peak and dip at different points in their lives. Moreover, both genders have very, very destructive instincts. Women have a hypergamous instinct and men have a polygamous instinct, both of which work to the detriment of developing long-term lasting relationships. When the free market unconstrained is introduced into a system like this, it will only result in disaster. And I know this seems altogether too abstract, so I put together an example. Let's take a look at two individuals, Jack and Jill, and just see how they might function in a Dan Savage-ized, corporatized sexual world where only consent matters and only quality matters. Let's take a look at the life of, say, Jack. Now, like most young men, starting at the age of 13, Jack has a vague notion that he will want to settle down with a wife and a family eventually, but for the time being, he wants to sleep with as many women as possible. Now, unless Jack is exceptionally accomplished or attractive for his age, he's likely to have a great deal of problems achieving this end. In fact, if he is in the lower 40% of the distribution of attractiveness, he's likely not even to have a relationship until much later in his development. So the early part of a man's life will be characterized by sexual frustration, a frustration that will not be reflected on the female side and which will not be understood by a sexual culture that's really geared towards more of an open experience. However, around his late 20s, Jack is likely to have a big turn in his appeal to women. He'll get more developed in his career, and he'll get more mature and confident, and thus a large amount of opportunities will open up to him. In this case, he'll be tempted to essentially exploit this and live out the frustration he had earlier in his life by dating and sleeping with as many women as possible. In the event that he does decide to get married, he might find the arrangement to be more of an economic detriment than a help because of the easy divorce laws and the fact that there will be an incentive for women to divorce. He's very likely to end up on the wrong end of a divorce settlement, which will financially cripple him and separate him from any children he has in wedlock. In the meanwhile, any children he has had out of wedlock, he will never know either. So we end up with a fundamentally atomized man who has no connection with any children he's fathered in either of the events I've described. But before we feel too sorry for Jack, let's look at what the post-sexual revolution culture has in store for Jill. In contrast to Jack, at a young age, Jill will have a more definite desire to settle down and have a family, and have an immediate desire for a relationship and strong emotional validation. Now, given the current contemporary sexual culture, she'll be encouraged into early sexual exploration. This will include relationships with a lot of men who have no interest in developing the kind of emotional relationship and validation that Jill wants. As a consequence, she will feel very alienated from her sexual experiences and will look for an outlet to explain that. 
If she persists in this culture, she will likely find this explanation either in the perspective of sex in the city, that this is all a giant game, or in the perspective of third-wave feminism, which blames the experience on the patriarchy. As a consequence, Jill is likely to spend her younger years in much more transient relationships, and when she finally gets around to settling down in her 30s, she will find the dating market much, much more difficult to procure long-term relationships with men who actually have the financial ability to support a family. As a consequence, Jill will enter her 30s with very little marriage prospects, wondering where all the good men went. She'll have a very low probability of finding someone to have a family with, and in the event that she does, she'll feel like she's settling, marrying down, and will be more or less unsatisfied with her lot. The probability of her having very many children will be low, and she will feel like her earlier ambitions for that ideal nuclear family have been subverted, and indeed they have been. Now, right here, I have told two stories that are really the product of the sort of sexual marketplace that Dan Savage and the other defenders of the sexual revolution have brought forth. And as bleak as any of these examples sound, really, they are commonplace in any forum online, be they MGTOW or feminist forums, where people complain about the problems they've had with the dating world. You hear this all the time. And in both cases, you get the impression that both Jack and Jill have been fucked over. Their ambitions have been destroyed. They've not obtained what seemed to have been a very real possibility that they wanted from the outset. And of course, the immediate temptation on online forums from both the MGTOW and the feminists is to blame the opposite sex. Certainly, if Jill was fucked, it was Jack who fucked her. And if Jack was fucked, it was Jill who fucked her. But this is not the case. What we have seen play out is merely what we should expect from market transactions going on in each individual circumstances where one party had the upper hand. The fact that both parties couldn't come together to cooperate was a byproduct of that market process. And if there is anyone who fucked them, it was sexual educators like Dan Savage. A lot of people might find my critique of Dan Savage to be a little bit harsh. After all, Dan Savage is only known tangentially as a sex advice columnist. He's only really popular from a few communities in that dimension. In the mainstream, most people know him as the founder of the It Gets Better project. This is a project that was started in the early 2010s and focused on getting gay celebrities and their allies to make encouraging videos directed at gay teenagers to try to dissuade them from committing suicide. Since the gay suicide rate generally was very high, this seemed to be quite a noble effort. And Dan Savage in particular gained a lot of credibility for pioneering this particular project. I have to admit, a lot of these videos are very sincere, and some of them are even quite touching, even from a traditionalist who does not believe in the lifestyle that they promote. It's hard not to admire people trying to dissuade teens from taking their own lives and self-harm. And in that dimension, I wish them all the best. But at the time they came out, I felt like something was wrong, that this was not entirely honest. And I believe that this was confirmed, because inevitably... The kind of message you saw in the get It Gets Better videos led inevitably to this. It's okay to be gay. Oh, hi, babe. Do you know what is so are deliciously hot to me? Ah, big bad penis needs to come in and pop your hymen. It's breath coming all different kinds of shapes and sizes and colors. Before you run out and start putting things in your butt, you gotta know the anatomy. Mm. For those of you not familiar with most internet or YouTubers, the clips I just showed you came from Lacey Green, a sex educator, and another channel trying to essentially copy her style of sexual education. In short, this is a new form of sexual education that's mainly meant to be shared over social media, and that targets a very, very young audience. You can see this in the very cutesy sort of Sesame Street style language that both of the presenters use. The fact that they always seem to be talking down to their audience like their children. But despite the disconcerting nature of the presentation, this type of sexual education has become all the more popular in the modern age. And it's hard to even conceptualize what the audience is. 
The mere presentation indicates that it's for a very young audience, but the subjects they discuss include oral sex, multiple partner sex, homosexuality, transgenderism, things that are just not appropriate or are classically not seen as appropriate for very young audiences, even potentially prepubescent audiences. So what the heck is going on here? It's tempting to say that this is just the sexualization of children in some sort of sinister and nefarious way, but I don't think that's actually what's going on. What's going on is sort of the extension of the idea of sexual liberation when taken to its logical conclusion. In fact, I think the entire culture reached a turning point with the advent of the gay rights movement, and in particular gay marriage, especially when that movement was portrayed as an analogy to the civil rights movement. The second that gay rights became analogous to the civil rights movement, it ceased being a reform and became a moral crusade. The It Gets Better project that Dan Savage premiered simply refocused that from adult sexual experience to the sexual experience in bullying faced by children, therefore by the necessary logic of the civil rights crusade that had become the gay rights movement. Educators had to focus their efforts of sexual lifestyle in on children. The impetus was purely liberation, but the end result was a propaganda campaign that essentially presented sex to children and sexualized them in a way they had never been before. I think I should step in here now and really present what would obviously be the counterpoint that most sexual educators would bring if I brought this critique to their attention. They would say that they have to provide this education because children themselves are having these experiences. Children are driving this. Children are the ones creating the demand. And the sexual educators are just responding by matching a need. They're just the ones being there, making sure it's safe. They're responding to a reality that is really impersonal and just something that derives from human nature itself. Frankly, I find this incredibly difficult to believe, even from my own experience. I have seen from my generation and compared them to this current generation that I was much more sexual and naive than the children that are graduating from high school now are. We also know that children of a previous age had very, very little exposure to sex and were more or less naive well into their 20s. So it seems like a fundamental quality that can change depending on society's attitude, not something that's driven necessarily from children's own perceptions of reality. I think we underestimate how plastic the sexual nature of children is. Now I know in the contemporary world, oftentimes much too much is placed on neuroplasticity, and people act like there's no inherent human nature. But in this case, I think that we really should take a step back, because all evidence points to the fact that children really respond in kind to the kind of sexual culture they're placed within. In this dimension, children very often will do what adults present as being normal or preferable. Now, I'm far from an expert in this dimension, but I have long speculated that early sexual contact to children, despite it being incredibly harmful, probably is not something that children would in and of themselves resist. Unlike, say, a hot stove that a child will touch and then immediately draw away from because they can feel the pain, Early sexual exposure is something much, much more like antifreeze, which tastes sweet as a child eats it, but destroys them from the inside. This would explain the type of grooming behavior oftentimes played up by pedophiles, who are able to convince a child to be a consensual partner in a sexual relationship that will later emotionally haunt them. But this further plays out because it indicates that we can push sexual education and sexualization of children back and back and back, earlier and earlier to younger and younger ages, and not really expect any resistance from children. Children will likely conform and repeat back the very lessons they are taught, and thus their cooperation with the curriculum will be represented as if it is the demand and the impetus for the education itself. The sexualization of children, while being done for sort of a civil rights and liberationist perspective, will nonetheless be something done to children, not done with any kind of legitimate consent by the children, even though it will look like that at the time. And now we get into some of the more sinister elements of this entire sexual revolution project. While it's generally wrong to associate sinister motives with your opponents, I can't help but thinking that people on the left and people who are the sexual educators must at some point realize the process they've started. 
they know that sexual education and sexualization will increasingly creep to younger and younger ages, and they know that there'll be very, very little resistance to this by children. They also probably know how utterly detrimental it will be to children when it is introduced from an educational perspective. While I genuinely wonder how these thinkers reconcile this core contradiction, I can't but help they think that this is inevitable, and they're simply trying to make the best of the situation. In particular, I think this takes two manifestations. There are those thinkers who actually think that the introduction of sexualization of children is going to be a benefit to both children and society in general. Already you can hear whispers about this in some of the more radical progressive elements of the web. Moreover, I think this whole sexualization of children has a reverse effect or a corollary where sexualization in general is treated as very much something that is part of childhood and something that is itself infantilized. Therefore, as children become more sexualized, adult sexual behavior becomes more infantilized. We see things like affirmative consent laws. We see things that essentially imply that there can be no consequences of sex because the people who engage in it aren't actually agents that can take responsibility for the decisions they make. This, of course, is the natural process of a sex that is engaged in in children who can naturally not be responsible for the things that they consent to. This provides ample opportunity for the administrative state and for administrators at the managerial level to become involved in adult affairs to a level unimagined before in a society where sex was prohibited and strictly between adults who were taking responsibility for others in a family arrangement. And here, the cruel logic of the core incoherency of the sexual revolution becomes fully apparent. It is an alliance between people of a perverted sexual nature and those who want an authoritarian control over adult behavior. The former see this as a portal to a new world where their behavior will in part be accepted under certain provisions, and the latter see it as a portal to a world where their services of control will be utterly necessary in order to stave off utter societal chaos. But the result will be a world where authoritarian control will have to be necessary in almost all areas of engagement, because to do otherwise will obviously work to the detriment of children and to the psychological destruction of the citizen as a whole. Frankly, I don't believe that any of this could even be incorporated into a society in the long term. As I stated in previous videos, this whole perspective of sexual liberation is totally incompatible with the larger project of having replacement level birth rates. But at the same time, I think the people involved in this project are less interested in the survival of society in the century level scale and are more interested in controlling society or even controlling society that's rapidly crashing into the ground. They don't care that the plane's going down, they just care that they're going to be at the helm when it finally makes impact. And hence you see the central obsession with modern elites at promoting sexual identity as a legitimate identity above that of religion and nation. People who have sexual identity as their primary identity are fundamentally identified as consumers, as people that need to be taken care of, as people that need to be served not as people who have responsibilities, as religion and the nation-state usually imply. By encouraging sexual identities over the more classical ones of nationhood and religion, we encourage people who are fundamentally consumeristic, and consumeristic people are easy to control. We end as a society of children who really only have identities as consumers and are totally dependent on the administrative state to take care of us and plan the future of our families and of future generations. The project of self-governance has been fundamentally defeated, but at a very, very subtle level, one that marched in the name of liberation at every step of the process. Now, I know I've painted a very, very bleak picture in the last three sections as I discuss the consequences of the sexual revolution. But in fact, I don't know if I've really done anything so unique. Such bleak pictures of the sexual environment have been portrayed by other people. They've been portrayed by feminists. They've been portrayed by MGTOW. But I think what was really needed is some perspective on what we can do about this, or some narrative that guides us to a path back to some sexual environment that is more sane. Now, I know I've gotten a lot of criticism for being a traditionalist, 
Feminists see this as being conservative and cruel, and MGTOWs see this as being a chump. But ultimately, I think that this is the only way that we can really reassert any kind of relationship between the genders, any kind of relationship to the sexual reality we face and to the development of families that is at all humane and that is at all something that both sexes will benefit from and thrive under. But first, I think we need to talk about the narrative, or a narrative that will allow us to constructively understand the sexual revolution before we can really understand why traditionalism is the best solution to its problems. So to understand something like the sexual revolution, I think we need to understand that it is fundamentally an economic problem, or rather a microeconomic problem. Now, I know like all things, models are always flawed, and this will necessarily be simplistic. But if you grant the fact that we can look at the sexual revolution in the way of economics, we can go some ways in order to understand what it really did and how it achieved those ends. So the tool I think is really required or necessary here is the tool of game theory. Now, game theory is the study of how two competing parties play a game together, each party trying to get the most benefit or the optimal benefit for himself, regardless of how it affects the other person. And in some sense, we can see this as an analogy to the sexual revolution. Both genders and both sexes play a game against each other, and they'll cooperate or compete as it benefits them. Humans respond to incentives, and so the game theory model is a very, very good way of thinking about this. Now, the most classic result of game theory is the game called The Prisoner's Dilemma. In this game, you basically have two players who can choose to cooperate or not cooperate with each other. If they both cooperate, they get a benefit that will pertain to both of them. But if one cooperates and one doesn't, the person who does cooperate is going to be screwed over. He's going to be fucked over. He's going to have a high detriment, whereas the person who does not cooperate is going to have a much less bad consequence. In the case where both don't cooperate, they both get screwed over. And I think you can already see the analogy to the two genders in the sexual revolution. Ideally, both men and women would cooperate together to achieve ends that are sexual satisfaction and familial development. However, in the process of playing the game, both men and women are presented with options to essentially not cooperate and take the advantage over the other party. This will ultimately resolve in both parties being less well off if the option is available to them. Now, the key result of game theory is that in such a game where both players are free to compete, where both players are free to cooperate and not cooperate, there is a certain incentive in not cooperating since you cannot count on the actions of the other person. Therefore, in The Prisoner's Dilemma, the classic problem, the equilibrium point or the Nash equilibrium point, the point where both players sort of converge to, is one of non-cooperation, even though this is the most detrimental for both players. Both players trying to optimize their output will inherently come to a point that is the non-optimal point and is in some ways the least optimal point for both players. As a result, systems are not always necessarily performing the best when both players pick independently, and some restriction is needed in order to force people away from this point of both not cooperating. I think the listeners will see at this point that traditionalism, and in particular committed lifelong matrimony, is that point of mutual cooperation that both genders and both sexes needed to be forced into in order to obtain a point of mutual benefit. They both needed to have the option of not cooperating taken away in order for the other player to commit, in order for the other player to know that they will not be screwed over in the event that they make the decision to cooperate. In some ways, we can see the history of the sexual revolution as a constant leapfrogging process, where both genders and both sexes started in a state of mutual cooperation. At each stage of the sexual revolution, from the introduction of birth control, each sex had opportunities to effectively take the option of non-cooperation and get a benefit. However, that benefit was undone later by the other gender choosing the role of non-cooperation. So, for instance, the sexual revolution started with the introduction of birth control. Men who worked away from their home were immediately given the opportunity to cheat on their wives with little or no cost, 
Developing a mistress before the sexual revolution was very, very costly because the mistress was very, very likely to become pregnant, and the subterfuge of the affair could not be maintained. But with the introduction of birth control, this was more or less something that could be maintained by any man who worked outside of the home. This initial element of non-cooperation was then fought back again by an element of non-cooperation that was third-wave feminism, and the sexual revolution kicked off in earnest. Therefore, as men became less faithful, women became less trusting of men and openly hostile to men in a lot of very fundamental ways. And then we started to develop the antagonistic relationship that we see in modern sexual culture, where both genders are trying to get the most for themselves at each stage of the process. As men let their polygamous natures become more apparent, women let their hypergamous natures become less restricted. And as such, divorces skyrocketed, and trust between all elements of the family disintegrated. This is not something that any one gender did to the other ones. Both genders were responding to the incentives that were apparent to them when non-cooperation in marriage became an option that was societally acceptable. And thus, the road to hell was paved by individual rational decisions all the way down. And now we sit where we are on the edge of a pink police state, where sexualization is fully liberated, and nobody is happy about it. Again, I'm going to anticipate some criticism that might come from defenders of the sexual revolution, the kind of people who read Sex at Dawn or Marriage History, people who think that traditionalism and marriage are really passe concepts that need to go the way of the dodo because they're just not suited for our modern corporate globalist environment. Sure enough, they'll say, this is in some case true that marriage was destroyed by a number of decisions brought on by the opening up of options to both genders. But this just means that we need to create new institutions, new ways of organizing families, families that are more open to multiple partners, families that are more open to people being stay-at-home fathers, families that are more open to many elements largely rejected by Christianity and Western culture in the past. This position is actually rarely talked about, but it's a more or less a mainstream position among feminists and among academics that have really thought about this. While in their personal lives they may practice what looks like a Christian monogamy with their spouse, they all know that the state of affairs is fundamentally unstable when it comes to society as a whole. They're planning for a future that really does not include the nuclear family, in which polygamy is practiced, in which the state, rather than parents, are the primary caretakers of children. They know that this has to come about because the sexual revolution can really not sustain the kind of family life that people have come to expect in Christian and Western culture. So what is my answer to this? Is this the future? Am I really just someone who's bitterly clinging to bourgeoisie concepts of family life? Am I, should I just get over my fascination with families? Should I just get over my fascination of fathers that are involved in their children's lives? Is traditionalism just a delusion? Well, I suppose it's more or less a matter of perspective. But before you go ahead and dismiss traditionalism as just the voice of the past, you have to ask yourself exactly what kind of sexual environment you'd like to live in. What elements do you think are valuable? Is a world where fathers know and raise their children valuable to you? Is an environment where the sexes feel like they need each other valuable to you? is an environment where people largely depend on their families rather than bureaucracies valuable to you. Because I would argue that these core values that even leftists say they hold when I ask them are only achieved through the existence of the nuclear or extended family in the traditionalist or Christian sense. The modern defenders of the sexual revolution are not deluded when they say that new family structures need to be created in order to accommodate the market forces we have unleashed upon sexuality. What they are deluded about is the fact that we can maintain the values that they themselves hold in light of these new family arrangements. In a society where male polygamy and female hypergamy are unleashed, in a society where we acknowledge that parents really have no responsibility of the children, we can really expect pair bonding to go the way of the dinosaurs. Committed relationships and romance will be a thing of the past, and very few men will ever know their children, and very few children will ever know their fathers. It is very likely, in fact, that children will be raised by the state more than anyone else. 
and we will depart from being a pair bonding species and conform more to the model of a tournament species, where a few men do most of the mating with women, and most men are left out in the cold, competing for whatever is left over in terms of scraps. Now, whether this goes on with the facilitation of the government, or this is largely a product of sexual marketplace values that's only patched over by a welfare state, is still left to be determined. But once we say goodbye to the nuclear family, I think this tournament model of mating is almost a foregone conclusion. If we care about having families that people are attached to, if we care about pair-bonded men and women, men and women that see each other as a resource, rather than something to be competed with, rather than something that to be managed by the government, then we are really asking for a return to traditionalism, a return to the nuclear family, a return to the area of the Nash equilibrium where both genders cooperate with each other and both work together to the benefit of the next generation. And of course, this will involve the cooperation of both sexes. This will involve both sexes sublimating their own desire if we were to return to some sane system of working together for the common good. Now, I can already anticipate critics saying that this is an impossible dream, that the traditional family is effectively dead, and what I'm asking for is to put the genie back in the bottle. But the traditional family isn't dead, and it's not so much a genie that needs to be put back into the bottle, but rather a very, very delicate glass or vase. If we but preserve and care for it, this glass will last for thousands of years. If we toss it on the floor, we'll never be able to put it back together again. Thus, the family relationships that lead to the nuclear and extended nuclear family are of utmost value to society. They are delicate, and people are right to be afraid of the things that subvert the norms that protected the sanctity of that family. And that is the true lie and incoherency of the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution taught that this thing of very great value, but of incredible delicacy, could be essentially tossed on the floor and then reused again. They told us that if we but smashed our plowshares, we could eat the crop that would be gathered at the next harvest. They taught us that if we but shattered our inheritance, we would still be able to collect upon it. And like all irresponsible movements before them, the defenders of the sexual revolution lie when confronted with the ashes that surround them and the sexual culture that's broken. They'll say that it wasn't their fault, that all of this was inevitable, that nothing they did or said, or any of the forces that they defended, had anything to do with the state of the modern world. They'll say that this was the fault of the patriarchy. They'll blame the tradition and inheritance that was bequeathed to them as being insufficient. Like all spendthrifts, their ancestors never have left them enough. And they'll say that it is our fault and our own bad decisions that led to this, that future generations deserve to have this brought upon them by their own selfishness, ignoring the fact that it is education that delivered the culture of the sexual revolution to the next generation. All of this will be told to us, but it is fundamentally a lie, and it is important that we see the incoherence implicit in the sexual culture that's being sold. This is the core of feminism. This is the core of the pickup artist community. This is the core of MGTOW. And it is a lie that needs to be exposed. It is a lie that needs to be confronted and smashed every time it appears. And we need people that will be unafraid to call the lie what it is.